my sisters and brother. And Good I. evening. I'm Pastor Kirk Hunt at Grace United Methodist Church. And right there is John Barton at uh, uh, Trinity United Methodist Church. And welcome you to our Bible study, read the book, read the Bible in a year. And John, would you please open us with prayer? Yes, gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we gather before you. Lord, we pray that you would watch over us, that your spirit would be upon us, that you would guide us as we strive to study your word. And Lord, we're finding that some areas of the Bible are more difficult than others, but we know as we read in 1 Timothy that all scripture has value. So Lord, open our eyes to the value of your scripture tonight. May we learn how we can draw closer to you through your scripture, and may we also learn how we can draw closer to each other as we continue to study your word. Lord, for all those who continue to be sick and ill and are suffering from COVID and other sickness, we lift them up to you, and we pray for your continued blessings into our lives and into the lives of all that we know. Lord, be with us now and always. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. I think we're going to go backwards today because uh, all the real meaty stuff came at the end of our week. So let's start with 1 Timothy. Um, haven't quite got to that passage John was just referring to. But if we start with uh, um, uh, the essence of why this book is being written, uh, once again, there's some false teaching that Paul wants to address, but it's not the teaching per se that is the essence of, of uh, or, or what's being taught that is the essence of Paul's concern. His concern is to make sure that we have uh, uh, teachers that understand what is expected of them. And that's kind of the, uh, so we often call this one of the pastoral uh, uh, letters because it's addressed to Timothy. It's not addressed to a church. So 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus are called the pastoral letters. And uh, the idea is Paul giving guidance to an individual to pass on as opposed to a letter to the broad church. Uh, that he has established pre previously. Uh, so we have a situation where he's warning Timothy of the false teaching. Um, and one of those things is how teaching is allowed to take place. Apparently they were having a problem in that church. Uh, it, he doesn't state exactly what it is, but he kind of nibbles around the edge of it. He talks about restrictions on eating. He talks about people um, that are, uh, now what was the other thing? Restrictions on eating. Oh, I forget what the other one is. But then he starts talking about the role of men and women, the role of elders and deacons, and gets into some controversial stuff. Ron, you, you agree with everything Paul's saying in there, right? No, but I'm trying to be loyal to the vision and the spirit of what I'm reading. And I have... oh, yeah, the door. Oh. There we are, John. Oh, oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> what, Surprise. what were you saying, Ron, about the spirit? Well, you know, I have been raised, and I, of course, read these scriptures many times, and, and our children kind of call me on the carpet because we have women pastors in our church. And now I go back to support myself with Timothy, and I'm, I'm struggling. Hmm. So should we have women pastors in the church? Absolutely, God speaks to women. What I found when I've looked at this is the word that's used for woman, the Greek word, is used in the New Testament 129 times. And you ladies will recognize that word. It's gyna, G-Y-N-E. 
99 times instead of it being about women, it's about wives. And so sometimes when you look at Paul's teaching and perhaps when you look at what Paul says in Timothy, what if the word had been translated, I don't allow wives to have authority over their husbands as one example, as opposed to I don't allow wives or uh, women to have authority over men. And so that might help a little bit in some circumstances. And the other thing you have to keep in mind, and this is a letter directly written to Timothy in a specific church, and that church is in Ephesus. And the uh, god of Ephesus was, I forget what her name is, but she was a, what? Probably not Diana. Yeah, I think that's right. She was a, uh, a many-breasted woman that fell from heaven. She was a fertility thing. And so their view of women was probably drastically different than what ours might have been. So you always, when you get into something controversial, like can we have women as pastors or uh, in the church, you, and you're trying to defend one side or the other, looking at Timothy or looking at it, some of Paul's other writings, you just got to look at it and say, well, was Timothy writing a general prescription against having women in positions of authority in the church? Or was he talking about a specific situation within the church? Yeah, in fact, there's other examples in Paul's writings where women are uh, uh, doing many things of value in the church setting outside of worship itself. Uh -huh. And that is what the study notices say. Mm -hmm. But of course, women can teach men. I mean, I had women professors who run circles around me outside of the church, but within the church, that's prohibited. Yeah. And, and some churches true. still follow that tradition. Well, very many do. Yeah. Well, and sometimes you have to wonder, and from pre other conversations that we may have had, Sometimes our children or those people who are asking these questions are trying to use that as a weapon to show what's wrong with our faith, that we're hypocrites and such. And we are in, in some times. And a friend of mine, retired United Methodist pastor, pretty much on the same page. He questioned that perhaps it might be difficult for the women in our male-dominated churches today, it might be difficult to win them to Christ. I mean, you really got to be on the top of your game as a, a female pastor. Now, some of these male uh, word for it. anyway. They expect to take leaders, orders from men, not accustomed from you to be in the service. Understand this. There's a shift change there that goes on. And then he says, you know, you know, we might be shooting us up in the foot and create a situation where it's more difficult for evangelism evangelize the typical guy, you know, the macho guy on the street. And I think that some things like that play into in the United Methodist Church, the selection of a pastor by the bishop's cabinet, too. Yeah, absolutely. How accepting will that congregation be to blank or blank or blank? And, you know, it, it can be more than just the, the uh, gender of the pastor. We, uh, my first appointment was at a little country church, and I followed a woman pastor. Uh, well, actually, I followed a guy that was just briefly there after the woman pastor. Uh, so, and they always had student pastors. And uh, one of the women came up to me, one of the women came up to me and said, I'm so glad you're not a, a woman pastor. There you go. And, and, and it's like, why would you, why would you say that? That, uh, 
I've, I've heard that same comment here after we found out who the pastor was going to be from women, that they were glad that we weren't being taught a lesson by the gender of who the pastor was. I, I don't know how to. And that's that may be the lesson that the cabinet tries to teach some churches that they have to be open to that but they also have to kind of consider the pastor that they're sending into that situation too. If they know that there's a church that would not be really welcoming to a one woman pastor, is it fair to her to send her, her to that situation? Uh, another church that I was in before I entered the ministry received its first woman pastor who also was a black pastor. And she struggled uh, uh, with some of the people in the congregation. And many people in the congregation welcomed her very much. And I, to this day, don't know whether it was a combination of both of those factors or one over the other. Uh, but, you know, we have difficulty as people in general of accepting change. And uh, so sometimes, uh, we have to experience the conflict before we can uh, understand the need to change, kind of like what you were talking about. Right. right. What is our view of a pastor? And does our view start with white male? And if it starts with white male, and if that's the only thing that we can see as a pastor, I guess I'd suggest that there's something wrong with our view. Yeah. But we're going to get a white male in the early church. Uh, you know, especially if you're in Judea. Right. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's another thing that we don't talk about very much yeah. is uh, the yeah. ethnicity of our Savior. Yeah. But, well, you want to still sit there? You have a list of notes. Yeah, I, I do. don't. Rats. I thought I'd get away with it. <laughs> right away, right? First church was pastor by a lady. She taught that little uh, country church how to tie. So I love that. I had no problems. <laughs> no problems. I never heard a word. And this, you know, I'm ancient. That was way back when. Yeah. So some, some churches have matured in the faith and have had a good experience. Well, Paul does talk about what he expects out of his. Uh, elders, they should be above reproach. That's that's a good standard. Uh, husband of one wife, I passed that one. John does not, so I don't know, John. Uh, huh? Yeah, but he doesn't even have one. Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable able to teach, not a drunkard. So not only do you have to be sober-minded, you have to be sober. <laughs> Whatever the difference is there. Um, not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not a lover of money. Manage his own household well, care for God's church. Keeping his children submissive. Not a recent convert. And well thought of by outsiders. So, you know, so what's the essence of this? Uh, as I read these requirements, uh, I see the essence as someone who's not going to allow people uh, to be critical uh, of, of uh, things that uh, are happening around this person. Uh, because if somebody comes in and, and they don't meet these qualities, uh, then there's going to be uh, an open forum for criticizing that person. And once that starts, it doesn't want to end. 
And uh, we've seen situations in the past, not just in the church, but in politics and local government and school boards and things where when someone loses the respect of certain key people, and then you have the talk that goes around it, uh, you might as well make a, might, you might as well just show them the door and start over because they'll never have success in that situation. Um, so I think I'd like to turn that around and say, well, what should the qualifications for the people that aren't elders in the church be? You know, so if, 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 if the leader is above reproach, what about the people? Um, if the leader's modeling the proper relationship in his life <coughs> in marriage, what about the people? Um, Sober-minded, what about the people? Self-controlled, what about the people? You know, uh, the whole idea isn't that this person should be above reproach and above the congregation, but be an example that the congregation can also live up to. That's what Paul kept saying he was. Well, and that's what Ron's example of yeah. the lady, the grandmother who taught the congregation to tie. She set the example. Exactly. And those are good things. Um, so it, it, it's, this is a situation where uh, Paul is not, if he wanted to have a letter where he's talking about the problems in the church, he would have written a letter to the church talking specifically about the problems and how to correct them. So what Paul is trying to do here in 1 Timothy and uh, probably also in 2 Timothy and in, in Titus is to make sure that Timothy and Titus, as they are leading these churches into the future, understand that the leadership choice is an important one. Uh, and, that, and that's true for us today. Uh, when we bring people onto the church council, we want to bring people that are uh, uh, good examples to the rest of the congregation. And then sometimes we pick Camille anyway. <laughs> she knew that was coming. <laughs> but it's important, you know, the things that you want to look for as a leader in terms of leadership in the United Methodist Church and for a church council, you want to make sure that you know, they follow uh, uh, the teachings of Jesus, that they have uh, evidence of fruit of their faith, that they do give to their church and that they do give of their time and that they do set that good example uh, for other people. Um, and that's how we pick our leaders. Um, and there are many people that never get picked not necessarily because they don't fall in those categories, but because they haven't stepped forward and indicated that uh, you know they're ready uh, for leadership or, or, or a different role. Um, you got to also remember that Timothy was Paul's protege, and Paul was nurturing him as you know one of Paul's replacements. And I don't know how many Timothys Paul might have had in his. Uh, ministry, but I'm sure there was more than one. Um, we just don't read about all of them because they're not all written about. Let's go to any other discussion on First Timothy. Do we have any trouble with the Judaizers? You know, I don't think that that's evident in the first three chapters. I haven't. In Paul's situation, that. Happened. Oh yeah, Paul did most definitely. Uh, and that may be part of it. I mean, I think they had uh, earlier in Ephesus, didn't they have in the Ephesians? Did they have that problem? They did. Yeah. But yeah. In Ephesians, yeah. And in Acts, they they write about the battle with uh, the silversmiths who. Right. But we haven't gotten there yet. But there was that battle going on between the lovers of Diana and their idols. Yeah, they didn't want their business uh, interrupted by uh, yeah. that's where they right burn all the, people. That's where they burn all the magical charms and stuff. Too, yeah, isn't it? and then one person, I don't know uh, whether that was in Ephesus or not, but one person who 
uh, was healed, um, that was making money for somebody yeah. couldn't no longer do it. Well, I'd like to, to back into John five and six. And I was looking through this and, um, and basically it starts out with Jesus ba basically um, showing the world and the world would be uh, uh, in Jerusalem at that point in time, that he was the equal of God, which would be a radical thing for anybody to do because that is exactly what he was accused of at his trial, that he was uh, blaspheming by claiming to be God. Uh, and then we have, as we move forward in these readings, he talks about being the bread of life. So not only is he the equal of God, he is the bread of life, that which will sustain people. And then as we finish uh, reading uh, chapter six, we find out that he is the way to eternal life. So um, as we think about that, we, it starts out with the healing at the pool on the Sabbath. And so this, is a, uh, this was during a feast of the Jews. It doesn't say which one it is. Um, and it really doesn't matter which one it is. He was there, and there was a man there that uh, was an invalid for 38 years. And Jesus perceived him as only Jesus can. You know, he knew Andrew before Andrew had ever met Jesus. Uh, and there's other instances like the, the woman at the well that he was aware of her background. So Jesus was aware of this uh, poor man's background and basically walks up to him and, and says, you want to be healed? And instead of waiting for the water to be stirred and Jesus allowing him to uh, assisting him into the water, Jesus says, just pick up your mat and go. You're healed. And he did. And then he, the man gets in trouble because he's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Uh, which is not prohibited in the Old Testament, but was prohibited by the interpretation of Old Testament rules by the modern day uh, authorities uh, on the law. So this is a setup. This sets up for what Jesus is about to share with the people that are kind of looking over their, uh, out of the corners of their eyes to see what's going on and why is there this conflict that's going on. And he says, uh, the John says, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Because Jesus said, my father is working until now, and I am working. So Jesus was claiming that God was working even on the Sabbath. And he was going to be working even on the Sabbath as well, which was another thing that kind of tweaked the ire of, of uh, the Pharisees and whoever else was, was in the crowd. So, so it's then that Jesus claims his authority. And we don't get this in any other synoptic gospels. Uh, John is the one that really teaches us uh, how to understand who Jesus is. And Jesus said to them in verse 19 of chapter 5, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel the people may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son, just as they honor the father. Now, if you had a pastor that all of a sudden broke out and started saying stuff like this to you, I would see, I would think that there'd be a lot of trouble, bro. Uh, with with that, I, I would see people having a hard time buying that. Um, had he heard? Had the pastor healed someone like? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. And if he had, would we would we still consider 
where that authority, where that power came from to yeah. heal. Yeah, and of course, for it to be an actually good example, it would have to be a situation okay. where you have a pastor without Jesus having been, because <laughs> obviously we would never do that uh, when right. Jesus, we know about Jesus. Um, but he goes on and says, whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So a couple things are going there, going on there. One, Jesus is setting up, or John, by, by sharing what Jesus has said, is setting up the basic theme of John that we come to eternal life through and only through God's son, Jesus Christ. Uh, and then it says, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So in other words, when we believe in Jesus, we already have the eternal life that is promised to us. Um, sometimes we don't claim that, or sometimes we don't feel like that. But uh, uh, we experience it fully in God's kingdom, but we experience it only partially, as Paul would say, maybe dimly in a mirror um, here on earth, because we have the earthly powers that are continuing to work uh, in this realm that we call our life. Uh, and some of those powers are not um, of God. Um, yeah. When you read that, it sounded like Jesus had died and come back. No, this is why he was still alive. Yeah. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, whoever believes God the Father who sent me, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed. He, he who believes does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So we have passed from death to life when we believe. And we don't come into judgment. Yes, which is a nice thing. Yeah. Because I don't want to be judged. Because you believe. Yeah. So that's the, uh, and that had to be very difficult for anybody to understand at that point in time, because he had not died on the cross for giving us for our sins at that point in time. So that had to be a really radical idea. But he doesn't stop there. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority. God the Father has given God the Son authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So, so first we're told that if we believe we're not going to be judged yet, we're now just told that Jesus has the authority to judge. And it's like, okay, now what does that mean? Well, let's continue. He says, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So this is a very interesting passage. He's talking specifically about the dead but that there will be a judgment based on what? Believe or not believe. Yeah, but if they died before Jesus came, how are we to interpret that? And that's where I have to rely on God being a just God. For all I know, they're given an opportunity, uh, you know, to make that decision. Uh, yeah yeah well paul talks about and i know that paul's teaching comes below jesus teaching but paul i think in second chapter of romans talks about everyone will be judged by the revelation that they have received yeah that's right and so everyone has enough information according to paul in there to decide that there is a God. And so 
if they've gotten that revelation, revelation and they believe in God, that may satisfy that requirement. So heresy? No, but this this furthers the thought to include right. those who have passed away. I think he was speaking about present day Romans, the present context. Okay. You, you people out there by conscience or by word, you know enough to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pastor Kurtz talking about those who are not hurt. But that leads us into an interesting thing to think about. So Jesus says that if you believe, you will not come into judgment. Then he says, I have the authority to execute judgment. And then he says, with regard to the dead, those who have done evil will be resurrected to the resurrection of judgment, which I would assume would be hell or what we contemplate as hell although that may not be what that means i don't know but uh so the question is what if all of a sudden we turn our back as believers on god uh and we live a life where we have done done evil uh from then on you know it's the old turn your back yeah, yeah, it's the old, is there, is it once saved, always saved? Or is it the grace that you accept is also grace that you can hand back to God if you turn your back on God? You mean once you accept Christ, you no longer have free will? No, I don't mean that. Well, I, yeah. I, I know yeah. you don't mean yeah. that, but I mean, that if you can't turn your back, I don't know how you could still have free will. Right. Yeah. And that's the danger that John Wesley was concerned with. Um, you know, there's the, some of the Presbyterians with, with their um, doctrine of, of um, you know, predestiny. predestiny. Thank you. Yeah. Where they where or you can't lose your, your, your state of grace. Uh, John Wesley didn't believe in that. I don't believe in that uh, because of the free will, which John is, is, is suggesting. Um, if you're free to turn away from the sins of the world and towards God, I think you're also free to turn away from the grace of God back towards the sins of the world and live that life. There's people that prefer it. I don't know why, um, but they do. Um, they're in big trouble, what they do. Yeah. Well, our, I know we haven't gotten to the book of Hebrews yet, but when we get to the book of Hebrews, we'll see that there's a lot of discussion about people that are leaving the Christian faith, that who were Jews who accepted Christ, and now they're being persecuted for their faith, so they're going back to Judaism. Are they in... What boat are they? In? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's well, yeah, it's the same. It may be the same boat that uh, people who haven't even heard of Jesus are in. Right. Um, you know, and in our modern world today, there's still millions of people that have never heard about Jesus or haven't heard the true good news of Jesus because of how it may have been presented to them this is above our pay grade. You know, I should have prefaced this discussion in that way. Uh, we're not going to figure this out because it's not our job or our, uh, God hasn't given us that to figure out. Uh, there's a lot of things that are mysteries, you know, uh, uh, and, and we see that uh, throughout the Bible. There's mysteries that we are just not going to figure out. Um, but then we come to the witness to Jesus. Jesus says, uh, I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So he's talking about God. But he says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. So what Jesus is saying is don't rely on just what I'm saying. There is other witness to what I am saying. There is another who bears witness about me. 
and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Uh, who, who might that be? God the Father, what'd you say? John the Baptist. Uh, in our notes, it suggests that it wouldn't be John the Baptist, but John the Baptist is another witness. I think that's what they were saying in the notes. Um, and that, but he says in the very next line, you sent, you sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. So even Jesus says that John is a witness. I don't know that he was the witness that is in that uh, uh, line just before it. Um, but then he says, not that the testimony that I receive is from man. So there's a hint. But I say these things so that you may be saved. And in, in the notes, it goes through a number of, of potential witnesses uh, to who Jesus is. It could be the prophets. You know, it could be Moses when he said that there will be a prophet to come in the future. Uh, it could be God the Father. It could be God the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, we have God's witness when Jesus was baptized. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. We have the dove coming down, which could be the a witness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there, there's a lot of different things that witness to who Jesus is. And I think it was probably left on the ambiguous side intentionally because it would take forever to uh, cite all the witnesses that are in scripture and that happened as in as Jesus walked the earth. I've never really thought of that before, though, un until I read this uh, this passage in this study Bible, um, and that's an important thing. How do we know Jesus is who He is? Well, we are basing it on in John's gospel. We base it on signs and wonders. We base it on uh, uh, other Gospels. We base it on the story of the resurrection. We do it in John's Gospel, too. Uh, we, we base it on uh, what Jesus empowered other people to be able to do. We base it on our own personal experiences uh, with the Holy Spirit and with one another as the members of the body of Christ. Um, that also lends credence to the concept, the Wesleyan concept of prevenient grace, where God is luring us into a relationship um, to, with his son, Jesus Christ. Um, any other thoughts on being a witness or, or what the witnesses might be? Let's talk about bread of life. It starts out in chapter six, well, Jesus is feeding 5,000 men again, and the women and the children. And the note says that could be as many as 20,000 people. And uh, Jesus asks the question, what are we gonna, how are we going to feed them? And Andrew comes up with uh, 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 an example. In fact, this is the first time that the, I think the disciples are referred to as a group uh, in John's gospel. Uh, and Andrew says, oh, there's a little boy here. He has five barley loaves and two fish, but they're not enough. And Jesus says, have the people sit down. And then like the story we've read three times before, they were fed, there was plenty, and there were leftovers. That sets up the next two stories because the people wanted more of Jesus he secludes himself, gets a recharge by praying with the Father. Uh, then instead of going through the people to find the disciples who already had left in the boat, he just takes off and walks across the water. It's a lot faster. And of course, um, the disciples are afraid when they see him. And what does Jesus say? He says, it is I. Do not be afraid. Well, what do we know about the phrase, do not be afraid, whenever we read that in the Bible? Who says that in the Bible? Jesus says it, but who else says it? Daniel says it when the angel came, or Daniel's warned not to be afraid when the angel yeah. comes to him. How about when the angel appears to Mary? 
and Joseph. Wow. And just about any time an angel appears to anybody, we see a form of the phrase, do not be afraid. So right off the bat, that is a witness that whoever's saying this, and we know it's Jesus, is a heavenly figure of some kind and not just a person. Then he says, it is I. Who says it is I? Not necessarily in that phrasing. Or maybe you could say it like, I am that I am. Yes, which sounds like there's something burning going on, a burning bush. That's God's name, I am that I am, or however you want to translate that, which and, is, right, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, in these, in these verses that we're reading, in these chapters, and in chapter seven as well, Jesus uses I a lot. Yes. And, and when he's saying that, he's saying that to the Jews, and the Jews immediately recognize that he is saying that I am. There's two ways Jesus refers to himself, and both of them are accurate. He says, son of man, which is his human leadership kind of thing, and I am, which is his state of being the son of God. And one causes more of a reaction than the other does. Jesus, God himself said I am. That's right, with Which the burning bush. Way of saying they both have the same DNA. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And there are some major religions, I mean, very large, well-funded religions <laughs> see Jesus as the vice president. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I won't go there. Not on not on this. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go there some other time with you. Um, so this leads into the next passage, which is "I am the bread of life." So Jesus has just fed people. Jesus has just demonstrated that he is not of this world, or not only of this world, by walking on water and using the I am phrase. Next, he says, I am the bread of life. So everybody catches up to Jesus. They figure out where he goes. And then when they catch up to him uh, down in verse 25, it says, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. I fed you. You just want me for what I can give to you. But they which, don't even want what he really wants. That's exactly wants right, which is ironic because he's about to give them what they really want. And this is the most incredible story, I think, in John. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. What does a seal mean? Yeah, it's a confirmation. It's a legal doc. It's a legal way of, 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 of making sure that everybody knows that this is true. For on him, God has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the work, works of God? And he answered him, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Okay, so now he's asking them to believe in him. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Another one. Give us another yeah. one. We haven't seen enough. Then we'll believe. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it was written. It's like all of a sudden they're getting religion. <laughs> Not only that, but they're getting religion and it's like their fathers were great examples for them to follow. How much did they grumble before? Exactly. Uh, so he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses that gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they still didn't figure it out. 
They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Please. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. And then what happens? Grumbles. I love that word. I love that word. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? And I believe that the Jews, in this case, is not the authorities, right? Didn't they say that that was, uh, oh, that was somewhere else. But they said, is not this the son of Joseph? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Oh, now he's claiming if they haven't already figured out that he is God. I'm teaching you, you will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Does he leave it there? No. No, nope. he said, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews disputed among themselves. And it says, uh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? You know, the Romans accused the Christians of being cannibals because they talked of eating Jesus's flesh and drinking his blood. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, do you think anybody truly thought they meant that, he, that we'd have to eat Jesus's flesh and drink his blood. I don't know. It might have confused some people. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. This is kind of flashing forward to the Last Supper, but not quite. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So if it's not the Last Supper, feeding would be what? Following his lead, uh, abiding in him, drinking his blood. He says that one straight out. As the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread of the fathers that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in a synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. It doesn't stop there. Yeah, this would be an awkward sermon. I mean, if, if, if Jesus were here, 
<laughs> um, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Can't say I blame them. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were, his disciples, the people that had been following him, he didn't say the 12, John didn't say the 12, but he said people that had been following Jesus, his disciples, that they were grumbling about this. He said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. Then we get the parenthetical. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. So Jesus already knew that there would be people that were following him that would not come to belief, and he already knew that one would be betraying him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And then we have the saddest part of this whole story. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So then Jesus turned to the 12. Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? <laughs> and yet one of you is the devil. And then they act surprised at the Last Supper when he says that one of you is going to betray me. He spoke of Jesus, Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he was the one of the 12 that was going to betray him. So this is, this is kind of the essence of John that Jesus is the way to God. We haven't even gotten to that phrasing yet. That's in chapter 14, that I am the way uh, language. But John has laid it out here right in the middle of these stories that Jesus is the way to God. And we still have people today, many of whom claim to be United Methodists, that want to believe that Jesus is just a way. And some of us may be those people. Somebody told me that one. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because we understand as good Wesleyan Methodists that God does extend his grace to everyone. And we want everybody that we love to be with us eternally in God's kingdom. So our grace, which is like God's, is that we want everybody to be there. So we also sometimes allow ourselves to think that if they're good people, they'll get there, which fall, flies in the face of what Paul is teaching us, or that they may be able to get there through some other means which also flies in the face of what Paul is teaching us and what John is teaching us. Um, but we'd like to think that a Buddhist or a Hindu or a devout Muslim or a devout, you name the religion, would also find their way to God. And I can't say that they won't, but when I read this, this is the only way that I can assure myself that I can make it there. And we're talking about free will. So people have the free will to do that. You know, in, in my heart, in my little heart that doesn't understand the full mysteries of God, I'd like to think that um, by, by uh, um, following their own religions, they'll find Jesus somehow, and then we'll come to the full belief in him. Um, but I don't know how that would work. For most people. Ron, you look like you've thought about this a lot. Do you have any comments? Well, it's the picture of a mountain and all paths lead to God and salvation. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change what we read here. No, it does not. It does not. So when people ask me, well, what about people that say that? My suggestion is, is when you're interacting with people that want to believe that, 
that you that you might indicate that I understand why you want to say that. You know, I, I want people that I know and love who may not have yet accepted Jesus Christ to be with me eternally in God's kingdom as well. But my understanding through my faith is that Jesus is the only way, and that's the only way I personally have the assurance of eternal life. And I invite you to think about that. Um, and the Gospel of John would be the default position. Yes. I mean, I heard people say, if you're going to read anything, yeah. read this. Yeah. And some Bible and yeah. And, and, you know, there's also a a caveat to that if you've not read anything else you may not want to reach on first because then you don't have the background uh, you know i think there's a reason why john is placed after the synoptic gospels because we have this understanding of who jesus is and then john hits us from a different angle to say by the way you do fully understand based on what you've read in these other three that that's not how john wrote it but i'm saying this uh, that Jesus is the son of God. He's fully divine. I mean, if you didn't pick that up in the birth story, if you didn't pick it up at the time that he was baptized, if you didn't pick it up in the story of the transfiguration, I'm here to tell you that he is the son of God and, and the way to God is through him and through him only. And people struggle with that. When is free will not free will? thinking about what he was saying if we give ourselves to god we die out to self yeah we give up our will well we can sure take it back even if we give it up it's kind of like giving up our sins to jesus and then we take them back anyway um i know i've done that over and over again sometimes um i think she's going back to the not my will, but thine be done. Because we yes. have a world where I get up in the morning, I've got my own will. I got my plan, I got my challenge. God, you know, and we get together and work it out. But so often in the calendar, I think it's noticed. Yeah. Yeah. And we have the free will to give our will over to God. Um, I don't know that God ever keeps us from taking it back, though. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am an Armenian. Armenian is the, the line of thinking that we have free will and that we have control over our free will. Um, I could think when Jesus was praying in the garden. Yes. You see, he's struggling with that. This Absolutely. Problem, that was his human side, struggling with it, as any human being would. And it may also have been, uh, you know, an indication of, of uh, you know, the, the, the Satan's last effort at tempting him, because we learned during the temptations that Satan was going to come back at an opportune time. I think that's beautifully portrayed in the, the Passion of Christ. Uh, if you've watched that movie, which is a difficult movie to watch, because it's so violent. I think it's also when Jesus is struggling in the garden, we do not understand what he was facing. But he did. But he did. He understood that he had never sinned. He understood that he was going to be a once true sacrifice. And he understood that for a time at least, God was going to turn his back on him. Now, I wouldn't inflict all the sin that I've uh, accomplished in my life <laughs> and that which I'm going to yet accomplish in my life on any one of you because that would be horrible. Imagine times however many billions of people have been on this earth all and will be on this earth all being placed on him at one time. The agony would be indescribable. Indescribable. Um, and that's the cup. That's when he says, "Take this cup away from me." Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Take this. I don't. I don't want to take this sin. His human side saying that. 
Well, any other thoughts about John before we move on to Daniel? I thought we were starting at the beginning now. Oh, <laughs> nice try, John. <laughs> Um, did anybody besides me find the last six chapters of Daniel radically different than the first six chapters? The first, yeah. six, the first six chapters were fun and interesting. To yeah, read. it's like reading Genesis. Yeah. I, I love the stories. The last seven or the last six is kind of like reading the book of Revelation. Not so much fun. What do we need to know about all that? How many different theories of what these visions mean did you read about in the study notes? I mean, there are at least three main theories on just one of the visions uh, and then other sub theories and all kinds of stuff going on. What do we really need to know about Daniel? Uh, Camille, I think you said it before we began. What did you say? That's right, God wins, we know how it ends. Revelation. Yeah, just like Revelation. And we also know that um, there's a seal put on at one point in time because we are not supposed to understand everything, right? Isn't that what it said? Now, where was that? That was... Uh... Oh, where was that? I should have highlighted that. Yeah, he said, oh, King of Wills, time at the end of King Shells. Well, we also learned that there's an angel, Michael that is the Prince of Israel and that there is the angel Gabriel, who's kind of a, we call him an archangel, but who has more power than Michael does. We also learn that there's a Prince of Persia, unnamed, that kept Michael from answering Daniel's prayer uh, for three weeks, I think it was. Yep. Um, so we do know that there are spiritual beings working both sides uh, and that even those on the wrong side can influence what happens to people of faith. Um, I still can't find Yes, where's that? That's uh, 12, verse uh, 9. Verse nine. Okay, I'm on the wrong page. That would make sense. Okay, so uh, going back up, uh, uh, how long shall it be, uh, starting at, at verse six and a half, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. So it's like three and a half of time, whatever that is. And that when the shattering of the power, when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, I can't imagine why. Uh, oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Are we in the end time? Apparently not, because the words have not been opened up for us. Huh? Well, yeah, I think people have said that every every age um, uh, that's that's lived. But things I, are going crazy. I have heard recently that uh, if we require people to show proof of vaccination to get their to get a job or to be able to hold a job that that's the, the proof of vaccination is the mark of the beast that you have to have to buy and sell. <laughs> yeah, it could be. 
<laughs> it could be. Uh, does that mean they're going to tattoo uh, our, our, our vaccinate? Because we can do that ourselves. Just like we can make our own vaccination cards because they're so easy to forge, uh, we can tattoo ourselves and, and claim to be vaccinated. So, um, this is real. Yeah. Facebook it is real. Message from a lady. Uh, I knew her in the youth group when she was 17 years old. And she was 60 years of age. And she was asking me to tell me what would, what does Jesus say about vaccination? She said, people say I should have it. Other people say it is the mark of the beast. I'm telling you this book. I got this message. Wow. And I, I wrote, and I, I long respond. First of all, I said, I have been back vaccinated. I, I'm certain that Jesus wants to do good and no harm. And it would be a terrible thing if I took this to my wife, my children, my grandchildren. We know where I'm going to be. Yeah. And I said, have no fear. Do what Jesus would do. Do good. Yeah. And if you are health compromised and the vaccination would be dangerous, that wouldn't be doing good. But then you have to take other precautions for your own personal health and precautions not to give it to somebody else. Um, so this is out there. Yeah, it is definitely out there. Oh, I've heard all kinds of crazy things that people are coming up with. You know, we've, we've, we've had this, um, uh, I, I'll just throw another one out just so you can chew on this. And you'll say, thank you, Kurt. I didn't need to think about that. Um, you know how our government is now acknowledging that there are, we don't call them UFOs anymore, but they're, I forget what they're calling them. Um, there are uh, things out there that we can't explain that have been filmed and have been observed. Uh, well, there's one guy that's saying that if we have a situation where all of a sudden the aliens reveal themselves to us, that these aliens are really going to be working for the other side and that this will be a mark of the, of, of, uh, the final days, then that they will say that, you know, we will provide you with this and that and the other. And really it's, it's like a mark of the beast kind of thing. And it's like, okay, I didn't need to think about that, but <laughs> it's something to think about. All kinds of crazy things come when you're studying Daniel, when you're studying Revelation, um, and regardless of what we might be led to believe or what we might want to believe or not want to believe, we need to remember the overarching truth is, is that God is in control, God wins, and if we keep our faith, we are safe eternally. Does not mean we won't endure something that is horrible. We already have. This pandemic has been horrible. Um, but it does mean that if we keep our faith, uh, we'll make it into the eternal kingdom. But some people say, well, if my faith is strong enough, I won't get COVID. Well, why don't they say my faith is strong enough? I won't die a physical death. Or I was thinking about it from a personal standpoint. I used this example on church on Sunday that as I was laying on the floor and looked down and saw a bone sticking out of my leg should i just have assumed that an ace bandage would fix it <laughs> <laughs> wrap it in an ace bandage and hobble away yeah rub point. some dirt in it yeah well i did that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's that same sort of thing well yeah. if my faith is strong enough i won't get sick if my if i pray hard enough for someone they their cancer will be healed. Yeah. You know, there's any number of these and, you know, it's not my will, it's God's. That's right. And, and, and we are not in control as much as we want to be. I mean, to take, to take uh, what your argument that they're arguing to, to the extreme, it's like, okay, walk out in front of that speeding truck Absolutely. and if you have faith you won't die you won't die see how that works you don't need to cr you don't need to look both ways before you cross yeah. the street because that's taking the knowledge of man yeah. you just have to trust god yeah and we've seen 
people in the uh, Hope House community that have that kind of a belief system. And um, it troubles me when, when people think that God will protect them from getting a disease when pretty sure you've had diseases in your life, you know. I mean, I had measles, I had mumps, I had both kinds of measles before they had the shots. And uh, many of you know people that uh, had polio. I got, I got the polio vaccine too. My sister was playing with a girl who dropped dead from polio later that day. And if that didn't scare the neighborhood, nothing was gonna scare the neighborhood. Fortunately, nobody else caught it, but she dropped dead. That was a scary thing. How did that work? Did they catch polio? Is it something else? Yeah, yeah, it's a virus. Yeah. Anyway, we're not here to talk about polio. Um, Let's talk about hope. Hope? Yes. Oh, well, I don't know if we got any hope left. <laughs> yeah, we got some hope left. Uh, I, the six chapters of Daniel that we read for this week are extremely difficult. And I, I really, just like when we get to Revelation, we don't have to figure it out. It's not meant to be figured out. It's full of visions. Visions aren't necessarily what's going to happen in the way that they will actually happen. You know, there's a lot in a vision. And uh, we're not supposed to know about all these things because they've been sealed. Uh, so uh, we do need to know that there is evil in this world that is working against good. We do need to know that we're on the side of good and that good will win. And we do need to acknowledge that whenever good and evil are confronting each other, there's going to be collateral damage to good people in the midst of that, some of whom may be us. Um, if the end times come now, you know, we, if, if, if we get raptured up and don't have to experience any of it, that would be wonderful. I don't know that that's going to happen. I don't know how to interpret some of those passages either. Um, we may be living in a time where some people believe there'll be a thousand years where, where um, there'll be uh, the conflict. Um, some people believe one thing, some people believe another thing, and the bottom line is it doesn't matter what anybody believes, what's going to happen is going to happen. Um, and nobody knows what's going to happen or when it's going to happen. Have you ever taught Revelation, Ron? I've attempted to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's probably how I would phrase it. The people that you pay their salary sat down and wrote a chart, explained this, and I've always been, I've always leaned toward Larkin, dispensationalism, and the church age explains a lot of things to me. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, look at this. And uh, when I got done with it, I thought, oh my, I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's we're not supposed to. Um, John, have you ever taught Revelation? In Sunday school. Mm -hmm. uh, I, taught a, I taught it in a, uh, um, a Bible study that I had with a group of guys. And uh, like Ron, I, don't, I, I think we knew more about the book of Revelation, but in terms of knowing what's going to happen, I don't think we knew any more than we did when we started out. You know, it's fun to learn about the seven churches and what that might mean and, and some of the other things. But when you get into the deep visions and things, it's... And really, to make any sense of it, you can't try to teach it in four different possible yeah. scenarios. You just almost got to pick one. Yeah. I remember when I was a teenager, I, I got some of this literature from some group trying to explain all the... Uh, all the uh, the visions of Revelation, and I was starting to get into that, and then I realized that, that you're never going to conclude anything. I mean, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but you're never going to come to a conclusion because it's it's not something that we're capable of doing, and uh, um, nor are we supposed to. Nowhere in here does Jesus say that 
if you come to me in order to come to me you have to figure out the book of revelation <laughs> in fact he refers to daniel a few times but he says basically hey you know that son of man guy he was talking about that's me you know and and that's about all we really need to know <laughs> is 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 um you know i think we can be comfortable let's let's go to what camille's desire let's look at psalm 98 just for a second in chapter 8 verse 26 is another the reference that uh what does it say uh the vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true but seal up the vision oh okay so it's in there twice yeah my blurry eyes towards the end may have confused which one I was thinking Drops of. The Bible that not at all. Yeah. Oh, I could not wait because I read all the notes. I don't know if all of you guys read all the notes or not, but I read every word of them. And, and I was so thankful to be done reading Daniel when we got done because I was, it was just driving me nuts. I just did not enjoy it. I don't think you're supposed to. At least not the last six chapters. Psalm 98. Look at the note. Uh, the, the, in, in, in the, uh, that's highlighted. It says, this hymn celebrates God's universal kingship by referring to the marvelous things and salvation that God has worked in his sight of the Gentiles on behalf of his people. The flow of thought is straightforward. God has worked salvation, rescue from evil for Israel, which all the ends of the earth have seen. All people in the earth should join Israel's celebration because God is their rightful king. The material creation should join all mankind in jubilant praise of the one true God as they look forward to his life. There are many overlaps of Psalm 96, and it goes on. Um, and then it says, uh, where is it? Uh, this psalm lies behind Isaac Watts' famous hymn. You may have heard of it, Joy to the World. I never knew that, that he based uh, a lot of what he was saying, but it makes a lot of sense. So when we sing Joy to the World, we're not singing it from a point of view of the Jews, we're singing it from the point of view of this Psalm, which is saying that this is joy that's being given to not just the Jews, but to all the, all the world. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Not, not just the Jewish Messiah, but the, the savior of the world. That's really cool. I never, I never connected that with this Psalm before. I'm sure Camille, you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it says it right there you know it, it's talking about the lord has made known his salvation not just to israel but to the whole world and it still frustrates me that the jews never seem to pick up on that that's why he gave it to us yeah well, because we wanted to, because <laughs> we wanted to be included. Um, yes, he was. Paul was very frustrated. And many Jews became Christians, uh, just not all of them. Um, where am I going with that? Where I'm going is, is that we have to be open to the same thing, that God is saving the entire world, not just Christians. So we've got to be open to these kinds of proclamations being given to people of other faiths, to people that we don't like, to people uh, that we can't stand, to people we might be married to that, that don't believe. Uh, uh, it's the simple proclamation of joy is something that we should be extending to our world whenever we can. Uh, and we need to be the example, we need to be the light that will shine on them so that they will be attracted to the light and come to the light to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, so 
That's one of the reasons why Christians sing these psalms. Uh, we don't sing them. I've only been in one church that actually sings them that, that are as written in the hymn, hymnal uh, because they're difficult for people that aren't uh, used to reading music and, and singing uh, tunes that they're not familiar with. But we sing psalms in a lot of our hymns, Joy of the World being one of them. We sing song, psalms in many of contemporary music that's being written today. Uh, so we still sing psalms. We just may not sing them as written in the, the psalms. Um, anybody else have another psalm that they enjoyed this week? Well, I, I was wondering, Camille, would you sing Joy to the World in July? Sure. Why not? I don't see any reason not to, but yeah. I, I think we've got it so pigeonholed as a Christmas. Him that most people and if I if I put that down as a yeah I'm sure that somebody will have a conversation would say she has absolutely lost it. Uh, <laughs> well, the, then they'll have to say I did too because I would support you 100. Yeah. <clears> percent <throat> But they already know I've lost it, so that may not help. You. Um, anybody have anything from Proverbs they want to note? I, nothing spoke to me. First Chronicles five through nine is a bunch of genealogy. So that I didn't get too excited about them either. Um, and numbers, what I liked about numbers, uh, although there were some of that genealogies in there too, uh, what I liked were the prefatory notes. Um, and I'd like to draw a couple of those to our attention. And this would be in the introduction to numbers um, there's a, the first paragraph summary, the composition of numbers cannot be discussed just on its own, as it is an integral part of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So for a fuller review, see introduction to the Pentateuch. The evidence for the authorship of numbers itself fits in easily with the position suggested there. Moses himself is said to have written chapter 33, Oh, that's not the paragraph I wanted to talk about. Page 280. Am I on the wrong page? Next page. Sorry. Um, oh, and I just lost my place. I'm sure John knows exactly what I'm trying to say, though. You guys remember Stan Can? He was the guy on Johnny Carson that would bring out all these things and they would never work for him. He was kind of a comedian. Sometimes I feel like Stan can when I'm thumbing through my Bible. I can never get to where I want to be. Are you talking about the, the biography of Moses paragraph? No, it's the next page. Uh, at the top of 288 in the small print, in the large print, excuse me. It says, Numbers thus relates a most important stage in the early history of Israel. Genesis begins with the creation of the world, but soon focuses on the life of the patriarchs and ends with their move to Egypt. Exodus tells us how they left Egypt and came to Sinai to receive the law. Leviticus contains some of these laws and Numbers still more. Numbers also summarizes the 40 years in the wilderness. And then the last one, which we will be coming to, Deuteronomy, the sequel to Numbers, has Moses expounding the laws and urging the people to obey them. Deuteronomy ends with Moses' death. So that, that's a helpful way of understanding the five uh, books of the, uh, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, and then in the third paragraph, it says that Numbers is to be classed as a historical work, not only because various details in it are corroborated by archeological discoveries, but also because it deliberately, it deliberately sets out to record what happened on the journey from Mount Sinai to the Jordan River. It does this to instruct future generations of readers with the lessons to be learned from the wilderness experience. It is saying in effect to the reader, your forefathers made many mistakes on their journey to Canaan. Make sure you do not repeat them. John, that sounds a lot like what you were saying about people that said, 
our forefathers got manna from heaven. And, and it's like, well, what did they do for you after that? Not a whole lot. Um, and then the third thing uh, on page 291 of the small, of the large print, um, it talks about numbers and numbers, which is very, uh, it, numbers is about a census. And, and I'm not going to read this to you because you can read it yourself, but there's, num there's all kinds of numbers in the book of numbers. And it's like, where do they come up with these things? How can there be millions of people in the middle of the desert surviving, uh, you know, for 40 years? I mean, does that make any modern sense? Could we do that today? Yeah, I, I know they had babies, but just eating and drinking in the middle of a desert, you know, what the answer is, it can't be done without God, right? Um, you know, I mean, how many people have we put over in Desert Storm? How many people did we have? Were you anywhere, anywhere near that? Uh, I mean, it took aircraft carriers, uh, it took uh, all kinds of, of uh, for cover, it took uh, ships uh, to provision, it took all this stuff to get stuff there to feed the soldiers that were not anywhere near six million people uh and we were shipping things like water and stuff uh for the soldiers ourselves and we were doing all kinds of stuff to provision them how did these people survive in the wilderness and the answer is they could not without god i mean only god can make water come out of a rock and i mean a rock not a rock <laughs> see what i did there john yep yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. I -E -E. I'll, I'll be playing tonight at the, never mind. Can I offer something here? Absolutely. Anybody seen the movie, The Battle of the Bulge? Yeah. There's a blonde German general that leads the offensive to push through the bulge. And uh, they, uh, oh, uh, an allied plane, an American plane <coughs> is shot down. And there's a chocolate cake in the wreckage of that plane and they give it to that german general and he says we can't win because the americans have enough money and enough planes to ship chocolate cakes across the atlantic and that's that's what kurt's saying there when he's talking about how difficult it is to provision yeah an army you know and so you want to stop an army all you got to do is blow up their fuel depot They'll stop it real quick. That, that just came to mind when he was talking yeah. about how difficult it is to get supplies. In. But but in this, uh, there's a lot of proposed solutions yeah. to these things. And, and I, it says the figure sh should be taken at face value is one solution. The figure should be taken at face value, but they correspond to the population of Israel at a very later date, possibly in the time of David, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me why that would happen. Uh, or that the numbers were changed due to scribal misunderstandings. And I think there's maybe even a couple more on the next page. And yeah, the numbers are symbolic. Yes. And then, uh, then there's the summary. But the bottom line is, is that um, don't get caught up in the numbers of numbers. Get caught up in the journey. And, um, you know, how God was there trying to lead them into the holy land that he promised the patriarchs and how the people even after seeing the 10 plagues in egypt after seeing the waters parted after seeing birds fall out of the sky and manna appear magically on the ground in the morning they, yeah and it kept happening how the people still had their doubts that God was leading them to where he wanted them to be led. And the modern day equivalent is that is when we share the story of Jesus with someone and they still have their doubts. So are we any better? Yeah.
Yeah. We do need to understand that, that just telling somebody briefly about Jesus isn't necessarily sharing the gospel with them. Uh, which really sharing the gospel is when you tell them how uh, your belief in Jesus has made a difference, a radical difference in, in how you live your life. And one of those things I think about is how many times uh, will we be held accountable for this our step? Yeah. Step forward and talk with us people. Yeah. Yeah, I hope it's not one of those deals where they said, tell me, tell me where you shared. Yeah. And you give one or two examples, and then all of a sudden you're shown eight or nine thousand examples of where you didn't. Because <laughs> yeah. that would be embarrassing. Well, I, I understand that. But we have to remember that while we may face a type of judgment, it's not going to be a judgment of our salvation. It won't be the uh, um, resurrection of judgment. Right. It'll be, we'll still be in the resurrection of those saved, but we'll be, I think holding us accountable is part of the purification right. process, the perfecting process, to use a Wesleyan term. I think he used it. Anybody got anything else before we conclude? Brian? This may be an aside, but to me, I thought it was kind of uh, I over there, uh, Numbers chapter 3. I think administratively, God made a big change, a big switch, because He gave it to Moses. Mm -hmm. He put it on His shoulders. Now, here's the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to have a, a long time up here on the mountain with you. Mm. You're going to administer this to the people. And that didn't work out so well. The golden calf incident, I think, was the reason why God said, you can't put all this on one man and maybe Aaron. We're going to have to have a census and numbers and we're going to spread this out and give responsibility to the, the Levites, which is too much for one man. And even for them, of course, it got went sour time and time again. Yeah. But in our, uh, we do not have a congregational church government. Many denominations do. And the congregation, congregational congregations often, uh, everyone wants to get in on the vote to make the decisions. But we, that Moses found like you just can't turn it over to people. <laughs> they yeah. know. And so we have more of a centralization of power in uh, our local bureaucracy from the bishop and conference superintendents to the local church, where it resides, most of these questions reside in this particular group that's charged with making these decisions. And there's pros and cons, but I'm just saying, yeah. I think God knew what he was doing. Is, uh, he says, we had godly men, we had elders and deacons and people selected to take care of my church. That's right. And that's emphasized um, through Paul's writings about the gifts of the spirit and, and that we don't all have the same gifts, but we are all part of the body of Christ and use our gifts as God has given them to support the head of Christ. Um, and it works really well when we get out of the way and don't allow our egos to get in the way. Use our gifts as intended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And humbly. And uh, that can be hard sometimes because we're so sure, right? Well, let's go to God in prayer. Most Heavenly Father, we've run a wide range of topics tonight. You know, all the way from things that we can't perceive possibly in the way of visions to um, bold statements from your son laying out exactly who he is and John, John's gospel, which supports us uh, in coming to an understanding that your son is uh, our Lord, our Savior, that your son is God, as is your spirit. Uh, Lord, as we read through the Bible, help us to 
go back to those uh, pages in the Bible that do tell us not to make the mistakes of those that have preceded us and to also follow the good examples of those who have preceded us. Lord, help us to take what your son teaches us to heart so that we can share the essence of that with others in a way that will draw them into a relationship with him as well. We can't draw people into a relationship that we already have with you. They have to find their own way, but we can really influence others on their spiritual journey by sharing with them how we have made uh, a tremendous turnaround in our lives due solely to the faith we have in your son and what we have learned from him and through him. So Lord, as we continue to read through the Bible uh, through the rest of this year, uh, help us to know that there are still valuable lessons to be learned, uh, that we can still connect things from old to new and from new back to old, and that we can also uh, learn how these things can influence our daily living. So bless us with your word, bless us with your wisdom, and Lord, uh, give us an extra measure of that wisdom, just as you gave to Solomon, so that we can learn to interpret these things in a way that will be beneficial to others and will be beneficial to your kingdom. Uh, so Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you most of all for your son and your spirit. We are truly blessed. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all very much. We will see you again next week.